Hello everybody. I'm Elise. Welcome to my tea table. Today is Monday, so that means for you guys, I have another segment of our series, Dignified Hospitality, where we talk about how we can better bring dignity to our food systems. That's everything from the farm to the supply chain, to the restaurants, the chefs, the servers, the bartenders, and even the consumers. Because maybe we can always bring some more dignity um, I have a special guest today, which I'm very excited to have, and uh, I will introduce him now. Um, yeah, sure. All right, here we go. Let's uh, let's go see our guest now. Hi, Jacob. How are you doing? Hello, hello. It is good to see you. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for coming ah. on uh, and chatting with us. So, Jacob, I recently met you through Twitch. Mm-hmm. Thanks yes. for Twitch. Love I, uh, Twitch. I believe I bumped it. I was uh, referred to you through Ingrediology even. Awesome. Love Logan out of Ingrediology. So I just gave uh, a, a, a link to your Twitch channel because you are a streamer yourself. Yeah, Jacob? I am, although uh, it, I'm still getting things started uh, as I look over at where <laughs> the laptop I'm using right now is a loner because my video card died like the day after my debut stream. So it's like, ugh. It happens. It happens. But uh, we'll, we'll be ready. So what do you plan to stream? Or what's, yeah, the, why don't you introduce your channel and, and then also introduce yourself. Let us know what's up. Well, sure. Uh, well, my name is Jacob. I am a chef and a cooking school teacher out of, at, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, USA. I am currently, well, before the pandemic, I was teaching at a local supermarket called Drager's who has a uh, whose branches have cooking schools in them. I'm basically, I'm kind of one of their all-purpose instructors, but I'm also their in-house Asian cuisine specialist. Um, for personal history, I mean, I've been a chef for over a decade. I have a degree in culinary arts food service management from Johnson & Wales University. And I've got experience um, in pretty much all, all sizes and shapes of, of the food service and hospitality industry. Man, it sounds like you have like the perfect background and the perfect outlook for the future. The fact that you're on Twitch and trying to work that out is just, uh, it's perfect. I'm so grateful that we met and thank you to Logan at Ingridiology for, for making that connection for us. Um, so yeah, uh, Jacob, this is the first time. And again, your channel is called Hungry Wolf Kitchen, yeah? Yes, that is cool. correct. What does that mean? What's the, what, what, mm -hmm. what does that mean for you? Well, um... It's a little, it's a little tricky to explain, but uh, that's actually the hungry wolf catering is what I uh, is a little thing I started when I first moved to California, um, because well, for the if you're a Duran Duran fan, you're familiar with the song, and I thought that might catch somebody's attention. Yeah. Uh, and I used that, I leveraged that, I built my logo, I had my logo designed around that, and I figured it would be something that's both it. Kind of tickles the cultural zeitgeist and also has sort of visual appeal because most people will, in the food industry will go for something either abstract or um personal and this is just a little bit different i went with something cute yeah it's awesome um cool so you're a duran duran fan once upon a time <laughs> yeah Wait, does anybody become like uh, is a fan and then becomes not a fan? I just I feel like Duran Duran's music is something that you know is is timeless and classic. I won't argue, but also a lot of most of my experience in it came through covers. Okay, interesting. But that's, I, very I, interesting. that's a story for another for another time. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, today we're going to talk about hospitality. Um, I hope you don't mind. But uh, yeah, Mondays I like to uh, talk about hospitality. I love to bring guests on, so this is very special to have you here. It's been a little while since I've had an outside guest. Uh, I've actually been spending the past few months uh, spending more time looking at news articles and looking at stats. It's been pretty incredible. Uh, Yelp puts out some pretty detailed statistics about restaurant openings and closings, and uh, it's been kind of cool to look at those reports and get an understanding of what's going on in the market. Um, mm. 
uh, yeah, but today we get to talk, we get to talk about vision, we get to talk about experiences, uh, and, you know, of course, Jacob, with you being a guest here, I'm, I'm definitely, everybody's heard my opinions on everything, so uh, I'm going to definitely let you, um, you know, share with us your experiences. Yeah, well, I've got some opinions. <laughs> P- opinions are definitely welcome here. Even chat, if you've got opinions, please throw them out. Uh, you know, this is, this is meant to be a discussion. It's meant to be a discussion, and uh, the foundation of building a manifesto of what we would like to what we'd like to see in the food world and i'd like to say that all the people that have come on to this series are all kind of like-minded just passionate people about food artisans craftsmen um that uh you know i jacob i think you would agree with me do you think that like artists and, and crafts people deserve dignity oh absolutely no question about it yeah we work just as hard as anybody else <laughs> So, I mean, I I know that this is a conversation that we could have about any field, but, you know, just applying it to hospitality, I think that this is a a major thing. And I'd love to hear about your opinion uh, prior to pandemic. So, like, let's let's not talk about pandemic because the situation is very different now. Uh, We can talk about that later. But prior to pandemic, what was your feeling from, you know, the kitchen to the front of house to even the, the farmers in the supply chain? What was what was your opinion about the state of dignity for that industry? It was uh, very strongly negative. I feel that the entire food service and hospitality industry at large is notoriously underappreciated and uh, cheaped out on by both the general public and the government the people in governments that which we work for but you know food is an essential need it's like our main essential need right you would think that the people that are directly (laughs) responsible for giving you some of the things that you need to you know wake up tomorrow morning would be (laughs) treat would be treated with a little bit more respect perhaps a little bit of deference or perhaps a little bit more money yeah 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 um, it's, it's a shame, you know, that we'd have to say money is connected to dignity, but uh, in our current society it is. And so I, I think there's no shame in saying that, that more money, more pay, better distribution of wealth is, uh, is in alignment with increased dignity as well. So, um, Agreed. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's, that's great. You know, and I, I don't really want to like, I, I mean, uh, your comments were great. The situation is not great. I'm sorry if that came off that way. Uh, but, um, do you feel like that was, it's like that for the entire chain or do you think that there's just specific segments of hospitality, uh, that are toxic or, or undignified? That gets a little tricky for me. I think you could to varying degrees, I would say the dignity is there, but the respect and the provisioning that's necessary with the labor involved is absolutely not. Like I'll say, uh, even from the meanest farmer to the largest corporate food service client to a to a Michelin star restaurant, there's always going to be people in those places doing that work that are being treated poorly, that are not being taken care of, that are not being given the respect they deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> there's an interesting movement uh, happening on Instagram right now. Uh, it's called the 86th list. And oh. it, yeah, it's interesting. It's called 86th list. Uh, it's first started in Portland and Portland has the most mature community, but there's different communities and, and different cities. And basically, it's an anonymous platform to submit stories of um, discrimination or oppression uh, that oh. you've experienced working in food service. Um, and so I think it's great. And I've, I've done whole series uh, or whole episodes of this series just talking about cancel culture and like what is the use of it and how can we best execute this thing. And so my question, why I bring it up, and um, is my question is uh, for... You know, employees of service industry, a lot of times the fault is put on ownership or management. Uh, But, you know, as someone who's studied restaurant management, hospitality management, and and potentially has has worked in that capacity, 
do you feel like it's solely their responsibility or their pressures are, are even the position of being a restaurateur also undignified that causes these problems to happen? I feel like it comes back to a sociocultural issue at the core of it. Food service and like the, the entire food industry is treated as though it's equal parts disposable and also um, auxiliary. Like everybody thinks that if they lose their job, no matter what it is, all else fails, they can go get a job in a restaurant, busing tables or waiting tables. So it's treated with, it's treated as object, almost objectively lesser. Mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, I think I, I know a lot of restaurant owners, a lot of mom and pop, like let, let's mm -hmm. focus now just on the mom and pops versus like the larger corporate, you know, models, restaurant groups, but like the mom and pops, you know, like I don't see them rolling in cash and like hateful to their employees. I, I see them dealing with a lot of pressures and stress. Um, you know, from the market and then, and then even from investors, if they start taking money because opening a restaurant now costs millions of dollars, if you've got to do yeah, build outs and you've got to do branding and all that. So then, you know, you, you're in debt to some investors. Um, and, and these aren't like professional investors. These are wealthy, independently wealthy people that, you know, maybe they start as a patron of the restaurant and they say, Hey, you know, I want to help you out. And it's oftentimes those relationships that end up putting pressure, you know, all the way down the chain, you know, to the, um, to the labor or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I guess I just wanted to, to, to know your opinion on that because a lot of times, you know, people just demonize the manager, the management, or they demonize the owner without really understanding that they're also under pressures and, they're not necessarily uh, swimming around in the dignity themselves, you know? That's true. A lot of, uh, and you're right, like there are people, people demonize managers or owners not realizing that there's, there might be someone else further up the chain that they have to answer to. There's a, the whole, the concept of where the accountability has to end up. Mm -hmm. is kind of nebulous in in restaurants which is another problem like nobody uh, people can gripe about a bad server to a manager or a bad manager to the owner but what if none of those what if that's all managed by an external company and nobody has any uh, nobody that's actually in there every day has a say in what happens with the hiring or the training mm -hmm. yeah so for for years now there's been you know a movement um not not so much in food industry but in other industries uh in this idealization of decentralization so the problem that you just addressed is when things are centralized and siloed it's hard to manage things especially if that silo is in this completely other place that's completely detached from where the service or where the, the, the value transaction is happening. So um, how do you imagine if, if we were to apply the concept of decentralization to food, how do you manage, how do you imagine that that would happen? Let's see. I mean, it has to start at the, it has to start at the entry level. You need to make sure that there are standards for higher, for, all of the for all the the laborers all of the primary movers and shakers of what of the operation like all of the the all the cooks all the all all the trainers all the managers all the cleaners like all of the basically you have to st just like any pyramid you have to start at the bottom you need that foundation to be rock solid and constantly reinforced mm-hmm so I would say uh, if we were to talk about a pyramid in, in this this context, the, the actual base would be the consumer, right? Potentially, yes. But at the same time, like you have to, I would consider the consumer to be adjacent to that pyramid. I see. 
in in the sense that the pyramid is built around the concept of the consumer being there. Mm -hmm. Like the industry exists in response to the consumer, because the cons if the consumer wants something, the uh, and somebody is willing to provide it, the obligation is to make that as easy and as convenient as possible. While simultaneously, get, um, while simultaneously treating those that provide it with the necessaries they need to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Um, um, so you you teach cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you teach cooking to food professionals, or do you teach cooking to anybody? I teach, to, um, I'll teach to anybody. Uh, most of what I do in the cooking school is to uh, the general public, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much all ages. We also do some uh, young children stuff in the summertime when school's out. But uh, the let's say 95% of what we do is, yeah, the general public or, yeah. Cool. And so like in the, this experience, I'm sure you've seen the evolution of somebody's perception on food and their appreciation of food uh, and everything that involves in food, not just the, the actual product that we put in our mouth, but the whole process of it. Would you say that you've seen an evolution in people's perspective from in the beginning of teaching them? towards when they became, you know, more advanced and more understanding? I would say so, yes. Uh, in fact, that's part of what we do. That's part of our goal in the cooking school. Like by the time, usually our classes are only a few hours, but we want to, we want to kind of hammer home gently that point that there's a lot of work that goes into what you're eating. And we want to teach not only how to do it, but how to, but why it deserves respect and why it deserves attention and care. Because there's like, anybody can boil a pot of spaghetti, but you don't understand why it costs so much for handmade pasta until you make it yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, that's a task for sure. But, um, so I think that's great. And, you know, I'm going to say thank you for that service that you've done because, um, that's, that's a part of that foundation, you know, of the consumer. Cause a lot of the pro problem of the dignity in the hospitality industry is that it's like, it comes from the consumer, the customer kind of gives this attitude of this is not so or... entitlement. Ooh. Yes. The Karens or whatever you want to, however you want to define that one. But but even like their perceived value of food, like people have become so accustomed to not cooking at home, to eating out at least 10 times a week. Yeah, you know, there's people that legitimately do that. I don't know if you, you know about that. You live in the I Bay mean, Area. I mean, I do. I mean, I live in Silicon <laughs> Valley. It's yeah. Kind of, it's hard to miss. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, man, like, I'm still living off beans and rice over here. What the hell? <laughs> Me too, me too, me too. I'm, I'm totally there with you. But uh, we're talking about like the mass market and that the mass market is what actually dictates what goes on in this world currently. You know, uh, the, the business always provide what the customers want. And so somebody that's like casually dining out, but not, not casual dining, they're not going to fast food. They're like, they want to go sit down and have an experience. This is where you get into the problem with quick service restaurants. Like I can point a real, I, I'll point a different finger at Darby for this one in particular. <laughs> um, for like, you know, like that sort of restaurant, the Applebee's, the Fridays, the Ruby Tuesdays, yeah. um, the ones where you're paying, you're paying a, what you think is a reasonable price, but at the same time, it's, really not um the price you're paying isn't putting food in the mouths of the people who made it it's not putting enough money in their pockets and you're basically getting oh, what's the somebody in that food chain is getting shafted uh, uh, many people i would say yes <laughs> 
Or I'll yeah. say somebody like a capital S. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's just because, you know, the, the, the dining out experience has become a commodified thing. And yeah, people expect that it should be something that's affordable. Um, while, you know, when we talk about our, you know, technology devices, that's a whole different story. That's like, oh yeah, I'll pay, I'll pay, you know, uh, over a thousand dollars every couple of years to upgrade my phone. But it's like, you know, somebody, Maybe you will, I won't, I'm I won't, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> like let's see, I like I I use an iPhone, but like I've got the SE still. Like I I've had this for as long as forever. The only reason I the only reason I upgrade my phone is if my online banking won't work with the ver with the version <laughs> of the OS. That's literally the only reason I upgrade. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm on the same boat. I'm on the same boat, and I'm okay with it. You know, it took a little time. I I had an advantage. Um, I, I went to the Peace Corps when I was 23 years old, so that really kicked me in the butt at a young age, thank goodness, uh, that got me out of that mentality that you constantly have to have the new thing. And, um, and that also taught me a lot about food, too, because there was, like, street food that I could have enjoyed, uh, or, you know, there was places where I could have gotten prepared food to eat when I lived there, but it was rice and beans. And so right. if I ever wanted to eat something exciting or comfort or something that I wanted, I had to make it like really from scratch myself and innovate even ingredients to make it work. Cause I was like in the Sahara desert. So there wasn't a whole lot of stuff to work with. Um, oh yeah. Hold on I can imagine a friend of mine actually does has, well, actually a coworker, uh, did that well not peace corps but habitat for humanity and okay. she spent a while in jordan oh, wow. at, uh, about two years back Stop it. and she had similar stories to share yeah it's great you know those those types of struggles and i think the pandemic is doing that for a lot of people right now out of necessity as well like you know people are out of work and they can't even afford mcdonald's you know, so they're yeah. figuring out how to survive and that's great. You know, like those kind of struggles are going to help them. Uh, but, you know, there still is a big category of people that aren't necessarily super wealthy and aren't poor and, and probably still are accustomed to this commodified food service. And um, that's what I want to, I want to, you know, make the focus of this series is kind of talking about how staying within that, like we can't change people's consumer habits, um, <clears throat> but the, the business is obviously going to have to change. Um, and so I guess that brings me, you know, to the thing that I'm most enthusiastic about and what had actually caught my attention, you know, with what you were saying last week and, and instigated me to invite you here is around the concept of street food. Mm -hmm. And um, because that's how it works in all these other poor places where even poor people can enjoy dining um, is is and it's not junk, you know, because like our idea of street food is junk. It's like McDonald's or fast food, these types of things, which, you know, may trick you into thinking that they're delicious and that they're they're satiating you. But they, they're causing lots of problems and, you know, not to mention the problems within the supply chain, like what you said. Uh, but even just health problems. Um, oh, what? Yeah. yeah. What? What's your? What's your experience and your opinion on street food? I mean, I like it. I I have the good fortune to live where I live. Not here precisely, but this region has a fairly robust street food scene. Uh, some of it is a little commercialized. I actually have a former coworker who works for a company called Movable Feast, um, who specialize in uh, food trucks and like offsite and mobile catering services. But uh, I also know where to, I know what parking lot to get in if I want the malles yeah. at like one in the morning, you know? <laughs> Um, I still like the tamales out of the van, you know, like the random strained van that like rolls Absolutely. past your house. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Like, I, I, don't tell anybody I might be doing that once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, fuck, man. Why, why do you got to whisper? What's going on? What's that about? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's, um, because, 
Well, honestly, because a gringo making tamales in a in a Latin heavy neighborhood could get me stabbed. <laughs> Where did you learn how to make tamales? That's what I want to know. Um, I learned it uh, back in Virginia at a place called Tuscarora Mill. Um, the the kitchen crew is most as all different forms of forms and flavors of Latin America and South America. And I learned how, and a lot of the locals in the neighborhood that I lived were also. So on several occasions, I would, I would stop by like a local place that makes, uh, makes pupusas and sells it out of her back window and, or tamales, it's the same thing for tamales. And once in a while I would ask, uh, how they did, like I would, I would do my own research, but then I would come and I would ask a question. I would mm -hmm. polish my Spanish so, enough so that I actually understood it yeah. and the answer that followed because, boy, howdy, when they start to, um, if, when you ask a question in a, in a language that you're only passively competent in, uh, it gets a little weird trying to translate the answer in your head. And my Spanish isn't that good outside the kitchen. <laughs> Where, so you, you learned kitchen Spanish, that's just from your work? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, it was there was a language requirement for my university degree at JWU, and I did take it did take Spanish, but uh, I did that long. I've been working restaurants long before I went for the degree, so it was basically just polishing some of the fundamentals and removing some of the rudeness. Let's say because <laughs> when you learn kitchen Spanish, you learn a lot of uh, crude things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's been like a recurring theme it, when I bring guests on is this joke about learning kitchen Spanish. And um, there's something to that, you know, I, there's, a, there's a lot to like um, cultural identity and, and, and supporting dignity for people to be able to express themselves. And that might be one positive in the situation of, of kitchens. Could, could you imagine if like, if uh, if management like uh, made it wrong to speak Spanish, like they didn't allow Spanish speaking in the kitchen, oh, that'd be impossible. <laughs> like absolute, like there's no way. Like it, pretty much every kit, almost every kitchen I've ever worked in has been a, a mishmash of languages, mm -hmm. but overall the primary one has almost universally been Spanish. Of some form or flavor, like uh, I mean, it all depends. Like there's different, there's dialects and regionals, like the, and sometimes there's vocabulary issues. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the uh, trying to force language norms as opposed uh, instead of fostering efficient communication is a major potential hazard for any industry. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a good thing. I mean, that's one thing I have noticed in the food industry, even when I worked in big food factories, was there wasn't a stigma around Spanish language. Now, go into other environments, then there is. There's definitely a stigma to it. It's like... Oh, for sure. Yeah. Although, when that come that have I would say that, Lee, when, it, when you get more white collar, because my, my family also... Grew, I grew up in construction, so I get... Uh, I spent a lot of time around some very, some very dirty, dusty people, uh, <laughs> and Span and Spanish is just as just as free and clear there as it is in food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. But that's, uh, you know, white collar. That's that was the right word that you used there. Yeah, in white collar environments, um, you know, yeah, you uh, the language language barrier, code switching, all sorts of different things that can that instead of allowing more efficient and effective communication, they create a barrier between certain employees and the, their coworkers or man, and or management. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just, that just creates more problems than it solves. Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the first like positives to come to come by. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's a big thing of like allowing someone to communicate in their in their native tongue is is huge, you know, because there's a lot of places where you're not and that's oppressive and that's bad. Um, you know, not to say that the, there shouldn't be, you know, initiatives to to help increase everybody's perspectives and maybe English classes because, yeah, learning English, you know, could be an advantage 
or at least improving English could be an advantage in mobilization or whatever, uh, you know, in, in, in U.S. Absolutely. Culture. That's mm -hmm. actually, oddly enough, that's kind of what happens just as a matter of course. Like people who's like me, my, my first language is English. I'm teaching, I'm helping teach them English as much as they're teaching me Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. For example. It's, a, it's a good exchange. Yeah. It is a good exchange. Um, okay. So back to street food. Mm -hmm. Your definition of street food, you know, so it seems that like you, you, you said the example of like the, the lady selling tamales out of her back window. That for me, like, is the type of street food that I'm talking about. Then there's this other idea of street food uh, in places like Portland. Uh, you know, I, I just say Portland because that city has the most mature kind of movement around these like food stalls. Mm -hmm. And for me, I don't see that as street food still. Like that might be small scale uh, restaurant, but um, because those, those stalls are actually still very like cumbersome and expensive to operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a pop up, like re pop up restaurants, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't well, I don't quantify that as street food necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's just rest. That's just a streamlined restaurant that can that you can happen to fit on a truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is good too. You know, I think that that there's there's opportunity there, but I think when we're talking about the opportunity of street food, that that in itself is extremely. Um, suppressed by you know legislation and and then also by competition too i'll just tell you a brief story what's going on here in las vegas mm -hmm. uh which again i don't consider this to be street food but there's still a conflict in, in our downtown area we have like a gentrified kind of art district downtown las vegas and uh that's like where all the hot new sh restaurants chefs are opening up cool little indie spots there and um <clears throat> there's a developer wanting to build like a food truck lot um, and there's a huge debate going on. The established restaurant owners in the area are very much against it, um, because of competition or whatever. Um, and, and feeling that, uh, that the, the food truck lot is not going to provide enough infrastructure to support, you know, the customers and everything going, like, i.e. bathrooms. Like, that's always a big debate is bathrooms. And so these restaurants yeah. are worried that their resources will be exploited and they won't get the business. Um, right. So, you know, it's not just government that that's against these or, you know, kind of holding up development in that area. It's also the status quo. Um, do you, do you, um, do you know of any places where, that this is not an issue and where where governments and, and local businesses are working to expand these opportunities here in the states i haven't done any recent digging just mm -hmm. for all because of all the mess uh and the the notion of dining out has been uh so polarizing and combative Mm -hmm. um, but I would venture to say that pretty much every major metropolitan area is at least in the process of trying to reach out and create an environment where uh, distanced eating and uh, and contactless uh, contactless dining are more viable options in the short term mm -hmm. and that i'm not i'm not sure how much progress is being made but i can but i am i am reasonably sure that people are talking about it yeah Okay, so Sorry you, to say I don't have anything concrete. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I don't either. But you know, I just that's why I asked you to see. You know, if if you have even if it's intuition, you know, not not actual data numbers, but just intuition. I think like New York City, there's been some movement there. Of course, you have the hot dog cart, which yeah, is yeah. I mean, I grew know. up in Jersey, so <laughs> dirty water dogs. I am no stranger to those suckers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like the grease, the grease trucks, the garbage plate, you know, like all of that is very familiar. Uh, and to a certain extent, like that's that's where you could have you could be looking 
for uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like you've got once upon a time, like the push carts, like, oh man, that you got me thinking about a book I must have read 30 years ago called the push cart war, uh, <laughs> where people, uh, where people were moving things, um, vendors were all moving things in there, either, you know, handheld or horse driven push carts. And then they got in this like turf war with motorized truck, like delivery trucks over it. <laughs> And so they would literally like they'd be out there with their cart, and the uh, the truck would stop at a red light, and they would just be like they would flatten the tire. Yeah. <laughs> dirty, dirty, dirty. Right. <laughs> Why does the food business have to be so dirty, man? Like no one's making lots of money. Like what? That's like, and sometimes in the tea business, it gets like that. And it's like, why are we, why are people acting so competitive and so grimy with each other? It's like, it's not like anybody is like really, you know, laughing to the bank anytime. It's like. Yeah, I ain't that the truth. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that New York is a good model for it. I heard that there was a guy, an Indian man, uh, that is somewhere in Central Park called the Dosa Man. And mm -hmm. uh, he he's become world famous. Uh, people, you know, come from all over the place to go try his dosa. And I watched this video. It was like a little documentary on him. And I just like I felt so much joy in my heart to see him because it's a humble thing. But then he's just so happy, you know. Like I, I was like, that is dignity right there. It's like he's not making tons of money, but he's making enough to survive. He's making enough to send his kids to school. He's making enough to to you know mobilize himself or whatever that means for him and and then serve his community and i think that that's a big motivation for people that get in food in general too right yeah to to not only support yourself but to improve the mood and the attitudes of those you of of your community of those who you interact with throughout the course of your work mm -hmm. yeah and so it's just so sad, you know, to see the people that get into it, like uh, bartenders, I think that's like a big place. I think bartenders probably deal with the biggest stigma that like, oh, being a bartender is just like, <clears throat> you're not committing to anything in life. You're just doing this, you know, to, to party all the time. And it's like, no, there's some bartenders out there that mm -hmm. legitimately see their work as art. And... They're so insulted when a guest sits down is drinking a drink with them and is like, oh, this is a good drink. You know, like, uh, what do you do? What, what do you really do with your time? Are what's you your like, real job? What's yeah, your that's real job? <laughs> like, uh, that's, that's, that's one place that I like. That's the sort of attitude where I would look to look somewhere else for a solution. Like for me, I would look to Japan. That's a because, good point, yeah. And like, it's an Asia thing. Like the understanding that it doesn't matter if you're going to be a millionaire, if you're doing something well, you're doing it right, and you're doing good things mm -hmm. for yourself and for those around you, then that is worthy of respect and it's worthy of provision. Mm -hmm. I like that. Worthy Actually, of like respect if, and worthy I of mean, provision. I mean, if, the, if, things, if things go substantially more to hell, I'm just going to go and start like a farm and a cooking school up in Hokkaido somewhere. And feel free to tag along. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Do you speak Japanese? A little bit. Um, my other degree, well, it's not complete, but it was in East Asian history. I, my Japanese was passable once upon a time. It has kind of fallen off because yeah. of lack of practice, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. My Japanese used to be very good, but it's all pretty. And the, in the shower this morning, I was like practicing all the languages that I've forgotten. And I'm like, man, I got to do this more. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, and it, all right, so I have a weird, uh, not a related question that's yeah. not germane to what we're actually talking about. Okay. But do your foreign languages come out better when you're drunk? Uh, uh, yeah, and I think that's just a confidence thing. Oh, interesting, because yeah. I, I had a different theory. If it's a confidence thing, I can totally get it. But my yeah. thought is when, um, when you're mildly intoxicated, the parts of your brain that uh, control your language patterns loosen mm -hmm. up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not, um, if you can't remember, like have you ever not re remembered a word in English and it came out in Spanish or French or whatever else? Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. 
that I feel like that kind of connection comes easier when intoxicated. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And it's also like when you dream too, because sometimes you'll dream in foreign languages that like maybe you've heard before, but in your dream mm -hmm. is just so fluent. It's like, so that stuff must be in your brain somewhere at all somewhere. times. <laughs> yeah. You know what's bad when there are subtitles and you're just like, yeah. When your dreams have subtitles, you gotta lay off the pickles before bedtime. <laughs> oh, that's what it is? Pickles before bedtime? I don't know. <laughs> I don't normally dream, so. <laughs> oh, you don't? No, I dream a lot. I'm, I'm big on the dreams. Um, and, you know, and the drinking. I've, I've definitely uh, felt... There's this, this this invincibility that you feel. It's not true, you know? It's like I may say, oh, I'm going to be a great dancer. I want to go figure this thing out. And, you know, you don't look as great as what you think you do, but yeah. you sure <laughs> yeah, feel like definitely. you're looking great. <laughs> it's like the invincibility star if you're playing Mary. You're like... Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's funny. That's funny. Um, yeah, so a, a cooking school in Hokkaido. That sounds very feasible, you know, because I feel like the Japanese culture is very much already like aligned with this, even though it's very like Americanized and, you know, they're self-proclaimed Americanized. Yeah, like that was one thing that they didn't adopt from America was this like laziness in their food. Like, you know, if you're going to go and enjoy good Japanese food, you're going to spend a lot of money uh, at a restaurant or something. Mm. Uh, and it's a whole ordeal, you know, it's like, couple hundred dollars a person but you know you're gonna have like a, a full nice experience and you're not gonna do it all the time it's a very special yeah. occasion thing versus here Absolutely. it's like oh it's tuesday night or it's tuesday afternoon i had breakfast here well let's go have dinner there and it's like what <laughs> um and so yeah like the whole like sustainability movement the farm to fork movement is like it's it's for real in in japan i feel like here a lot of it is like Greenwashing. Yeah, yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, word for that. I dug into that a little bit in uh, a lot of ecotourism once upon a time. Uh, did you say ecotourism? No, no, I said ecotourism, but okay. it, it, it adds up about the same. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. <laughs> It's true. And that's like, that's the whole core of, of, of greenwashing is like, it's just this marketing thing to satisfy the consumer's ego without really, you know, providing that value that that consumer thinks they want, you know, if they really wanted it, they would put in the extra work to find out, you know, is this authentic? Is this really what I say I want versus just some marketer telling me, oh yeah, this is good. This is fair trade, or this is whatever. Yeah, I work in that field, so like that's my daily my daily struggle is yeah, is on you know, that specific thing. <laughs> I had a feeling when I used the term greenwashing, you would immediately fill in all the gaps. <laughs> but yeah, there's not a whole lot of greenwashing going on in Japan. Although there's there's some weird uh, paradoxes in Japan. One I'll bring up is around. Um, their ideas around organic so the idea organic is very important for japanese people but then um so like if you want to export a product to japan the government makes you provide testing of zero uh, zero chemical residues and organic certification no tolerance on anything not organic but then if you look at like local agriculture in japan it's like over 99 percent is conventional they love using chemicals so that's like a paradox that I just didn't get when I lived there. To us, I... Oh, you lived in Japan? Lucky, lucky. Um, yeah. But I think I understand that from a cultural perspective. It comes from their, uh, their need to get the most out of the space that they have. Yes. Like, they, they can be okay with saying, hey, the, the rest of the world can afford to do this without these methods, but if we want to be self-sufficient, we have to do some. We have to be a little bit more aggressive in our methodology. Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, farmers that are just doing subsistence farming in Japan, they, they do things organically. It's just like the like tea is like a major cash crop in Japan. And so, yeah, the tea farming has become very conventional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I lived in Kyoto. I lived in the countryside of Kyoto for six months. Oh. Mm -hmm. That was like kind of the very beginning of the work I do now. So I was working on, on a tea farm. Oh, Bitcoin's getting curious. Sit down, boy. Yeah, sit down. Oh, good boy. <laughs> yeah, he's a good boy. So, all right. So we have this concept of like street food to be able to decentralize, um, you know, our food service systems. But like, what do you feel about technology? You know, outside of the whole ghost kitchen thing, like that, that's a whole other conversation we could have. But, um, but like, let's say Twitch, for example, that's where we met. And, you know, I think that like in Greeniology, like Logan has done an incredible job of launching himself up into that platform. Do you, oh, definitely. Do you think that there is like a, a real life feasible opportunity for, for, for chefs and for food professionals to, to, to explore that? I think possibly, but not necessarily in a street food context. Not street food. No, no, no. I'm just talking about like content, cooking content, food content, not street food. Oh, abso yeah. absolutely. I mean, you only have to look at the heavy hitters. You look at the the binging with Babish. Andrew is, seems a decent guy. Uh, you've got the now, I won't say defunct, but definitely took a beating. Bon Appetit test kitchen. You got. Uh, what was that? What, did, 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 what, what happened there? Oh, ho, ho, ho. educate me. <laughs> um, that was something of a. Um, okay, so the. Somebody who most of the test kitchen answered to. So it came to light that several of the, uh, the persons of color uh, in the test kitchen had not been getting, had been getting underpaid or not paid for their, t uh, for their video appearances. And there was, there was basically a large quantity of uh, inequality in the Bon Appetit environment. Mm -hmm. And several of the test kitchen members were very vocal about it all at once. And there was a very big dust up and several popular members are no longer affiliated with Bon Appetit, Condé Nast, uh, they've all either gone independent or been picked up by other places, like mm -hmm. uh, Sola El Whaley, for example, uh, has been picked up by Food 52, uh, occasionally Binging with Babish, and a whole bunch of other places. I know that uh, Claire Saffitz, uh, from who was known for her Gourmet Makes series, has pretty much gone independent, and she's now doing stuff at home and promoting her book. Um, Let's see what else. Um, so but, yeah, I had yeah, heard like, about the the Bon Appetit uh, issue. I didn't know it was about the the test kitchen specifically about their video platform. I thought it was just generally, you know, with their um, publishing. That was since they're since they have the largest platform and the largest audience. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of it came to a head. Yeah. But yeah, you but you are correct. It was it was rather more than just the test kitchen. It's yeah. an endemic issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know who else did something? Uh, National Geographic, like, because they're also a publishing company. They did a big kind of uh, proactive. It was not reactive. It seems that this Bon Appetit thing was a reactive thing, but um, they did a proactive thing where they, like, openly admitted, you know, our publication is racist and we're going to do what we can to, to figure this out. Um, there's, there's going to be a lot of that kind of work happening over the next few years, which is good. It's, yes. it's needed. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And it's great that it's happening. Um, uh, but like, so you're, you're referring to like larger publishing companies, right? But like, I'm referring mm -hmm. to like independent, independent guys, like, like you, like you setting up your rig and your kitchen and building up your own community and eventually finding ways to make money and support yourself with that. Like, I know you're just new at it and, um, you know, we're seeing successes like Logan, which, you know, even if we were to talk to Logan here right now, which I don't, I don't think he's in chat, but, um, you know, he'd like probably tell us, you know, it's not good enough just yet. Still have to build more to make it like something dignified and sustainable for, for their lifestyle. Um, but do, do you, uh, 
Do you feel optimistic that like that will be a route, not just Twitch, but the whole concept of like content online? Um, I think it's possible. I'm going to say we're going to have to take a lot of what well, a lot of what the food and drink streamers are doing now is we're also working in tandem with uh, a lot of educators in uh, comparing notes on the methods of dis uh, used for distance learning. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to create, for example, um, online both cooking, both cooking classes and also uh, um, just food classes, like food history classes. Like it's very easy to create to monetize digital content like this if you can get like a pricing guide and you can get a mailing list. Mm -hmm. It's um, the potential is absolutely there. It's just a matter of building your viewer base and building your uh, building your vis your visibility levels. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I take I take a lot of my lessons from not only mobile learning, but I'm also part of uh, uh, a lot of gaming communities. Uh, I used to be. I'm past my prime now, but I used to be a, uh, I guess you would have called it a pro Dance Dance Revolution player. What? Once Are you serious? Ago. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, it, spare you the story, but like, if I, if you define pro as somebody who made back a portion of what they spent to learn the game, then I absolutely am. Uh, <laughs> and I am, <clears throat> at one point, I was, in fact, one of the best players in the world. Um... Not so much anymore, but uh, the, the mu music game streaming and game streaming in general has provided a lot of useful information in terms of building an online viewership, in terms of building, uh, in terms of helping design uh, the environment for mobile, for being approachable online, mm -hmm. being approachable on video. Uh, it's been a, a, there's been a lot of very useful information transfer as yeah. far as that goes. Yeah, you I know, just wish esports had taken off about ten years earlier. <laughs> oh, you could have been a sponsored dancer. <laughs> yeah, nowadays I'm probably more likely to be a coach. Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, I've always wanted to get into that game. I've never been good at it. I'm really good at Guitar Hero though. Nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, like all rhythm games add up to basically the same thing. You learn how to you learn how to PA or uh, you learn how to time, and then you have to learn the controller. The yeah. timing is pretty much universal, but the controllers are the hard part. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Um, you know something that I that I I personally am taking on, and something I've talked with Logan about, and and other food streamers that I've become friends with, is. Um, you know, when it comes to Twitch, not so much with the gaming uh, influencers, because I think that community is pretty mature and like sponsorships and kind of the business model about how to make money as a streamer is a lot more mature than it is for the food streamers. And, and so I think a lot of the food streamers are trying to figure out how to like build brand partnerships and how to build, you know, perks for their subscribers. Uh, through brand partnerships, uh, it's a wild, wild west. Like everybody's working on completely different terms, and no one, and no one is really actually selling themselves their value that they have. Right. I'm like, like you've I'm... got a thousand regular viewers that are like actively engaged in you, and they they listen to every word you say, every word of advice. Like if you endorse a product, like the chances of someone connecting with that product are so much higher than an in Instagram influencer or whatever, but. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like uh, that, I know there's, I, I don't know very many food streamers that have any sponsorships at all. Like, I mean, I would love to get sponsored by like, you know, Cambro or something like that uh, or Vitamix or something along those lines. But you know, you take, you get what you can. Uh, one streamer I know, uh, Leon, Br Leon C. Brunson, actually he's got, what was his, uh, uh, Waiyaki, the Yerba Mate? Oh, wow. Uh, he's got, uh, I believe he has them as a sponsor, which oh, I thought was cool. really cool because that's kind of an obscure, uh... Well, Goyaki, their marketing team is very forward-thinking. 
Yeah, mm. I'm, I'm familiar with their marketing team. They're always two steps ahead of, of the rest of the market. So that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, like a, vit a Vitamix or like, man, if I was in the marketing teams of any of those companies, I'd be all over Twitch. I'd be like the first sponsor and I would totally take advantage of how all the streamers are pretty much underselling themselves. Yeah. You know, it's like, dude, like you should be getting thousands a month from these big, like a Vitamix or like a Instant Pot, like any of those, like those. Oh yeah. <laughs> like all of those, like basically indispensable borderline indispensable kitchen tools that home that that chefs who happen to be streaming at home are using like if i didn't have if i didn't have an instant pot over there i would be i would have a lot more trouble or like if i didn't have an immersion blender let's say or a or a vitamix or some or a waffle iron you yeah. know like there there are so many niche tools that can be kind of expensive that are totally worth it but if um if you could say if the company that makes them it's worth giving away one or two to the right person who can mm -hmm. plug the brand and mm -hmm. use it regularly mm -hmm. and boy can you get a lot of referral sales out of that yeah 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 it's a uh... But everybody's too focused on Instagram right now everybody's too fo and now they're trying to figure out TikTok and I'm like no that's like <laughs> where 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 are you at Twitch? Like freaking Red Bulls here. That's a flash here. in the pan. Like tick, <laughs> I, in addition to TikTok being well, I guess I can't say too much about that right now, because <laughs> uh, as far as who owns TikTok and what they do with their data. Yeah. But yeah, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, you're right, hundred percent. Like. Twitch has the, some of the highest potential for large-scale viewership. It has some of the highest potential for yeah, viewer engagement um, and the highest potential for just like direct person-to-person -person outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scalable like, person-to-person, -person, yeah. Like the, the opportunity for Q&A alone is priceless. Mm -hmm. Like when you ask somebody, when you ask like, if I'm streaming and somebody asks me uh, for a favorite brand of knife, I'll talk about a couple of them and whichever one they, uh, and even if I don't necessarily recommend the one they go with, I'm, uh, but I talk about it, they're still going to, um, they're still going to be made aware of the existence of X and Y and Z yeah. and the pluses and minuses of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hey, so man, I, I I didn't want to talk about ghost kitchens, but I said that word earlier and I saw a response yep. for you. So now I want to ask, <laughs> what's that about? <laughs> oh, that's, well, that's, I haven't, when they say ghost kitchens, it's actually fairly similar to a job I used to have. Uh, I worked in South San Francisco at a commissary kitchen, mm -hmm. which did, uh, which delivered food to a large number of tech companies and miscellaneous others throughout the Bay. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, my personal client, my and my crew's client was the Wharton Business School up in San Francisco proper. Yep. Um, and so I am familiar with how comparatively easy it is for a kitchen that's in a warehouse to do a boatload of volume mm -hmm. and then just deliver it anywhere you want yeah. yeah for comparatively low pricing yeah i mean now um and you when you weigh that against like a brick and mortar restaurant or even a food truck the return on investment just isn't there because like you get a you get something like the commissary kitchen that i used to work in and you can A, immediately start production, you B, immediately start it at, uh, at scale, mm -hmm. which allows you to keep costs down on your purchasing and on your, uh, and potentially on your hiring too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's just so many advantages to having the ability to produce at volume, especially in, a, uh, in an industry where profit margins are so aggressively thin to begin with that it's hard to argue against it like it's hard to fight it's hard to fight a ghost kitchen as a restaurant yeah how do you feel about um mr uber building the largest network of ghost kitchens in the country 
I mean, I'm not happy about it, naturally. Um, partially because just Uber and Lyft are trying to buy their way into uh, circumventing legislation. And, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Prop 22 that, that somehow managed to pass here. They basically, Uber and Lyft spent a spent hundreds of millions of dollars to get this piece of legislation passed here in California that basically um, gave them borderline ironclad protections mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of different, like, I don't want to get into it. It's um, a little bit complicated, yep. but not only did it grant them lots of protections as companies, yep. they also uh, snuck in a provision that made it almost impossible to repeal. I want to say it was something like a, a to repeal it. It required a seven eighths majority vote, which is like never going to happen. Yeah. Um, As you'll notice, most of the time in American politics, things are polarized. It's about fifty one forty nine at the best of days, mm -hmm. which is like oh, uh, <laughs> fifty one percent of everybody gets a pony, and forty nine people who, who voted for. Uh, Grandma's nursing home burns down. Like, <laughs> and I don't know why. Well, okay, I do know why, but explaining it would take me a week. <sighs> and so, a lot of profanity. yeah, I just like, uh, I'm, I'm not so enthusiastic about the whole ghost kitchen model just because, yeah, like uh, the centralized powers, like they're the first ones building it right now and the, they'll be applying that same kind of power dynamic. Um, yep, it's going to be the McDonald's ghost kitchen, <laughs> the McDonald's commissary, or like the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the TGI fr the TGI Fridays centralized distribution center. Yeah, but what I do, and and actually the Red Lobster opened their first uh, go uh, a ghost kitchen in um, in Chicago a few months ago, so it's already really? happening. Yeah, it's already happening. Chipotle Chipotle has opened up their first series of ghost kitchens. So there's like a whole bunch of Chipotles that you don't go order from inside. They're just for delivery. Yeah, so it'll be a thing. But I think that there's something about ghost kitchens from the research that I've done so far um, that there's a lot to learn from. And, and I'm actually very optimistic about the future of like consumer demands and like food marketing or like restaurant marketing is that the ghost kitchens like what they're producing is like what is working well within the food delivery apps so they're testing out a bunch of stuff and whatever's working is what they're doing and what's working is when um a restaurant listed in uber eats like only serves like one item like they specialize in one item mm -hmm. instead of having this expansive menu right because Two years ago, three years ago, if you were opening a restaurant, it was re really valuable to have this expansive menu. Like that's what a lot of chefs were really focused on having like these menus to offer everything for everybody. And what's working in the ghost kitchens is that like you might have one chef running five or six different restaurants because like, and, but they're all in the same kitchen and everybody's like the same team. But mm -hmm. instead of like those five different offerings being on one menu, it's like, they're five different brands because like, yeah, people are resonating and responding with brands that have specialty. Right. And I think that's good. And, that, and they don't care that they're all coming from the same place and made probably made by the same people. Yeah. They, well, they don't know. Not only do they don't care, they just don't know what they know is like when they're searching on Uber eats for what they want to order for delivery, like they're, they're connecting with and they're, they're finding value and brands that like only make one product. Like there's some type of inherent value attached to that, um, which that's Japan. That's very much Japanese food culture is like, if you're yeah. gonna, you wanna go eat something, like you go to that specialized restaurant. Like we go eat ramen yeah, exactly. at the ramen shop. We go eat sushi at the sushi shop. We go eat, you know, the izakaya is pretty much the only like kind of generalist place you go, but that's more of like a happy hour, let's go party type of a thing. Um, versus like, yeah, we're going to go out and have a lunch. Like usually you'd yeah. go to like a specialized place. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I, I kind of feel like this ghost kitchen movement is helping, uh, restaurateurs and entrepreneurs like kind of figure that out. You may be right. I think like, it's definitely good. At, it's it's going to help them dial in not only the customer preferences, 
but also it's going to help them fine tune their processes too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Normalize specialty. Mm -hmm. Like that was such a weird thing. Like if you were opening up like a, a trendy new indie restaurant and you only had three things on the menu, like five years ago, the food writers and in the public would have been like, what is this? Like, there's no options here. And it's like, maybe we don't need options. Like, <laughs> Yeah. It's like you, you got three things on the menu, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we do our best to make the best possible thing of each versus, you know, this reminds me of the meme. There was a meme that came after the inauguration a couple of weeks with, a, you know, Biden and, and, and it has his hand on the Bible, you know, swearing in. And they're like, oh, this is cool. They have the president swearing in on the, the Cheesecake Factory. The cheesecake. <laughs> as soon as you said it, I knew exactly what. Oh, God. I know people that work at Cheesecake Factory. But, oh, God. I know exactly where you're at. <laughs> that menu. Oh I mean, that must be a feat to operate in back of house, like. Oh man! Like if you've never if you've never seen it in action, it's, it's a freaking like. It's equal parts like to to run a cheesecake factory e kitchen. You got to be equal parts five star general and air traffic controller. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. Uh, my buddy here, he works for a chain called North Italia, which recently was acquired by Cheesecake Factory. So it's been kind of cool Ooh. to hear his perspe uh, his perspective of what it's been like, the transition to like the corporate mm -hmm. thing. And um, yeah, yeah, that's their, their whole idea. And they're even like redoing the menu and kind of Cheesecake Factorizing their menu, which was, you know, a very nice menu. North Italia, it's a chain. It's definitely not like a, a mom and pop, but mm. it has like a nice, a nice menu, everything made from scratch. And, you know, a lot of that's kind of gone under the table now because, you know, they're trying to centralize and aggregate and processize everything. Um, that is disappointing, but somehow not surprising. Mm -hmm. Anytime corp, anytime corporate America dives on something smaller, they try and cut the soul out. Yep, 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 that happens. So, um, yeah, supporting local support. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess maybe one of the last things that we can talk about um, is, <clears throat> you know, not only, like, our own intentions as individuals to support local, but, like, I think out of necessity, uh, we're going to come to a time very soon where we're going to be forced to go local, you know, uh, through the, these yep. like scarcities and, and commodities uh, that this pandemic is, is putting stress on. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of an exciting thing. Um, would you like to share kind of your thoughts on, on how you'd like to see that manifest? I mean, it would be nice to, I think, well, I mean, I've got my, my little herb garden and a vegetable garden out back, but you know, uh, I would like to say that a lot of this, the local, a lot of the problems that we could nip in the bud come from food waste, which comes from not just restaurants, but also uh, supermarkets. The concept of having full shelves and an abundance of X, Y, and Z on the shelves, produce, veggies, whatever, get anything uh, at any time of year, we can afford to dial that back. Like we don't need to get passion fruit in the middle of winter. We don't need, we don't need asparagus at Thanksgiving. Like there's a lot of things that, you, that have wormed their way into the, um, uh, particularly the American subconscious. And that's one of the ones that's dangerous. The need to be able to access obscure things all the time and uh modern supermarket modern western style supermarkets in particular are uh, guilty of aggressively enabling that and just letting it rot on the shelf just to say they have it interesting uh, you worked you worked at a grocery store yeah and, and an educator there uh what mm -hmm. was what was that chain's um uh strategy around that Minimize, um, 
basically we want to minimize perishables and also have a really, really, really tight inventory management. Like the goal is to prevent waste wherever possible. It helped that we also have the cooking school attached and we also had a restaurant attached to uh, the branch that I worked at primarily. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, it's like, we don't want to get things in that are too far out of season. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to get things that people just aren't going to buy. Yeah. Like if I, like if I'm there, if I've got to do a class, like I did a, like I did a sushi class there once upon a time, I can get the tuna. That's no big deal. They care of that. But if I wanted to do kimpira gobo, I'm going to go to a different supermarket because nobody at, uh, at this market is going to be buying burdock root. For example, mm -hmm. or if I want to do Kimpira Renko, nobody's going to be buying lotus root in the middle of downtown San Mateo. Uh, <laughs> so it's all a matter of knowing your knowing your audience and knowing your consumer base. Yeah, yeah. And being able to ta being able to aggressively tailor your purchasing and your uh, and your inventory to suit their needs, mm -hmm. while also minimizing uh, waste and turnover. Yeah. Well, I think that and I would is... venture to say that most uh, that most larger scale supermarkets, like and plus the big box stores that have groceries, like you know your Walmart, your Target, mm -hmm. your Safeway, your Harris Teeter, your Giant, your Stop and Shop, whatever, they are all perfectly okay with chucking a whole bunch of stuff at the end of the day, and they need to not be. I yeah. would rather I would uh, it would be much better to have half empty shelves when you open than a full dumpster at close. Yeah. 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 That's going to be a hard one, uh, to, 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 to solve. But I think like this, this inevitable scarcity that, that we're going to face is going to be, uh, a learning curve for that. But, um, yeah, no, I think this is great. And, you know, as an educator for, for consumers, you know, I think that that's, uh, I'm sure you've been doing it in the past, but I think now more so than ever, uh, integrating this like seasonality and, 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 and kind and, and what is it? Cause I think what would scare people is that like m people that are like cooking from home and, and trying to navigate this, like they have like certain go-to recipes or yeah. they have things that they're comfortable with. And so like what you're talking about is going to kind of require us to think bigger than that. It's like, Hey, you know, this is not the time of the year to get this thing. So there's other things in and we need to like figure out how to integrate this into our diet. Um, right. I think that that would be something really exciting, even from like a Twitch stream that I haven't seen yet. You know, I think ingredientology does a really great job. Like he's trying to talk to the everyday guy or girl and like empower them to have confidence in the kitchen and to, to try Absolutely, things yeah. out. And that's great. But that's like, that's just like the first step, you know, now we have to become more sophisticated and more advanced and, um, and how to become resourceful and like, mm -hmm. oh, our food, our, our food supplies changed a little bit. I got to figure out how to cook with this thing now. Cause that's all that's available to me. Um, uh, I think that that's going to be hard for people to navigate. And then unfortunately they're just going to fall. They're going to be more prone to fall into McDonald's or fall into, you know, packs of ramen noodles because that's something that is, you know, accessible. Um, yep. Yeah. Nothing wrong with a pack of noodles. You know, I, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they have their place, but. Um. They do. I mean, I, <laughs> my mom still makes her chicken salad with those stupid things. Oh, really? That's fun. <laughs> yeah, like, it's it's one of those weird, like, it's not, it, it's like kind of thing that you would see, like, in a church cookbook. <laughs> You know, you know the ones I'm talking about, the, like the home printed kind of like from like St. Luke's or whatever, like where every recipe has two cups of mayonnaise and like raisins and blah. Like 60% of the recipes are casseroles. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Or you get like Mrs. Like Mrs. Mrs. P's like favorite spoon bread or something like that. <laughs> oh, that's fun. That's fun. Well, hey, man, um, I'm going to let you go. I think we've had a good chat. Uh, I look forward to continuing this chat. And, you know, I hope we can stay connected. And, um, you know, now you kind of have an idea of the, the work I do um, and will continue to do on Twitch. Um, 
yeah, yeah, I think I think we're all kind of on the same mission. And so uh, I'd love to have you back again. Of course, love having you in the community. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you at another Tea Talks on Thursdays. If I can get there, I will be. Although if I, I was also considering doing an evening, uh, an evening stream, and hopefully I'll try not to piggyback <laughs> or double book. Uh, on tonight has, or Thursday? Oh, not to, not tonight. But I was thinking, I was pondering Thursdays, but I was also pondering like a weeknight dinner prep stream, like okay. just like an hour or so yeah. every night, like Monday to Friday. Oh, that that's smart. That's something good. like just like whoever's watching. It's like watch me make dinner for the household, mm -hmm. and it's like if I can do it in an hour, you can do it in an hour and a half. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, once your community gets bigger, you know, that's probably going to drag out into two hours or three hours just because you'll be keeping up with chat. Ain't that the truth? But I, that's, that's a good thing. That is a, that is a concern. But also, it's a good thank thing, you though. so much for <laughs> having me here. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your creativity and your community with me. This has been a wonderful experience, and I'm very grateful. Thank you so oh, very much. Oh, I'm the grateful one. Hey, you know, you're going to have to whisper me your address. I want to send you some tea. Oh, you are a treasure indeed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Because All you know right. I'm a, you know how much of a tea drinker I am. I do know, and I, I want to send you some, some nice Taiwanese teas. <sighs> I'm absolutely down for that. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> for sure, for sure. All right, well, hey, uh, if I ever catch you streaming when I'm getting off, I'll definitely be sure to, to raid and, 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 and check your stream out. But, um, yeah, Jacob, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, we'll and you're ya. very welcome. Yeah, it has we'll been a pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. Hasta la vista. Bye-bye. Oh, that was fun. That was super fun. All right. Well, we heard from the expert. There's hope. There's hope. It's got to come from all angles, though. All the angles. And we'll get to something dreamy, like... What is this? This is like a fried dumpling. And I bet you that fried dumpling only costs like 25 cents each. It's a good life. It's a good life. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for, for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, go make it in warp speed. You you got a couple hours. You got you got 600 people 600 people and a and a dog and a cat to keep happy. <laughs> I know what it's like to keep the dog happy. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I am. Uh, I'm gonna tune out. Uh, I've gotta go meet some friends and catch up. And uh, <laughs> I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of your week. I'll be back tomorrow night. We're gonna be having our art stream from the warehouse, a late night stream, uh, and uh, yeah, the rest of the week to look forward to. So, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Love you guys. Oh, actually, no, I just got one. We might as well stream or raid somebody. I like uh, my 